Welcome to Destination Linux episode 137. This is a podcast made up of four of the greatest minds ever to discuss Linux. My name is Noah. With me today are my super, super Saiyan of Linux, Michael, Ryan, and Zeb. Zeb, the adult, I'm sure you're not a Saiyan. What's going on with you this week? <laughs> Uh, well, I've been continuing my work with uh, Surge behind the scenes on my Gentoo install. Um, and another, th another thought I would get so engrossed in how complicated, yet once it's described, how simple um, it, it would become. Uh, and it's behaving quite well. Um, and I'm going to be doing another live episode on Saturday, the 7th of September, where we hope that there will be a new kernel uh, coming out. And that will be an LTS kernel, so we can make that um stick and then we're going to try and get uh, dxvk and cpu governor working to give that little bit extra for gaming not that it needs it at the moment because the gen 2 build has actually produced the best um fps for a return of the tomb raider benchmark test to date so yeah that's that's what i've been doing this week that's awesome and uh, ryan what what have you been up to so this week I released a uh, simple video actually using the System76 Oryx Pro that I have, but it's a 2016 version that I purchased on eBay. Now, System76 laptops hold their value really, really well. So it's actually hard to pick one up on the used market. Um, but if that person on eBay decides to install Windows 10 on that System76, they tend to lose a lot of value on as far as people looking for searching for those on eBay. So I picked one up for a really, really ridiculously low price. And so I now have the System76 Works Pro. But the video I did was basically if you get a used laptop using the System76 Works Pro as an example, some ways that you could do some maintenance on that, such as reapplying the thermal paste under the GPU and CPU and general clean out of a laptop. Uh, to improve thermals on there. And they did some benchmarks and some um, temp reviews to show the improvement that we made basically repasting that. Because after every general about three to four years, the thermal paste between a CPU and a GPU can get really cakey, flake off, you'll start getting high therms, and the system just won't perform as well. So and this is with any laptop. So in general, uh, redoing those thermal pasting is a really good step to yeah. do. I hate getting high therms. Exactly. And you uh, and obviously you're using uh, you're using uh, uh, what is it the silver stuff that you don't think is the best that is the best Noctua Arctic silver No I well Arctic silver is very good in fact a lot of them are very good right now I use the Noctua uh, thermal paste in this particular video but mm -hmm. Arctic silver has some brands they have a Arctic silver is one of those ones that has a l wide range of different types of thermal mm -hmm. some of those to me are a little too cheap and you could tell in the reviews if you go on amazon you'll see the one that has two three stars and then you'll see the arctic silver that has five stars and really it's all based on the type of materials that they're mixing in the ceramics that they're using etc that make the expense of a thermal paste go high or low in general i suggest going with a higher end thermal paste even if using Arctic silver on the higher end of Arctic silver so that you're going to get better therms and it will last longer and you're not going to have to replace it as often so, Michael, you said you hate lower therms. What inexpensive, budget-cutting, ridiculously cheap thermal paste have you been using this week? He uses toothpaste. Uh, <laughs> he uses okay. Colgate. Okay, to be fair, I got Ar Arctic Silver, but that was because I didn't know any better, so all that, that's the only one I ever heard of because of branding, so it's like the apple of thermal paste. Yeah, it's like the best. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is I have the Coffee and Linux event kicking off again on September 14th. So if you are in the Georgia area, you've never been to a Linux group before, this is a really fun one to join. We have a whole mix of experience levels, people who have uh, want to learn Linux, haven't even installed it yet, and people who are very advanced system administrators and network admins and everything in between. Uh, so we're going to be kicking that off. Bo's going to be there as well. So if you're into pen testing and want to learn more about it, generally his son shows up who's also in that field and always enlightening. But we are doing it at a new venue. So we're going to be at the Copper Coin Coffee House. And they were so excited to host us there uh, and basically gave us a nice, uh, fantastic deal on a giant room there. And we'll drink some coffee. We'll talk Linux. And maybe I'll, I'll bring out the System76 there so people can play with that while we're there as well. Nice. Very cool. Michael, what have you been up to this week? 
So I've actually got, I've done some some interesting things. I got a new SSD that uh, replaces my really like cheap SSD. And uh, what's what I did with that is also I set up Arch, the Archway, on yeah. on that on that drive. And uh, then I realized now after you know it's kind of funny because of the the amount of effort putting setting up Arch is not as much as people say, but when I go through the process of setting up Arch and then the process of customizing the vanilla plasma, it's a lot of effort. Like the amount of, <laughs> I realize the amount of effort with setting up the vanilla plasma versus, you know, Arch is about the same. Like you, you have to spend as much time doing both and uh, that's annoying. So if someone does want to try plasma, check out Kubuntu so you don't have to do any of that. <laughs> um, but yeah. How dare you, Michael? <laughs> it's, it's still, it's just... It's just a lot of effort. That's Are you it. still in Arch now, or did you go back to Kubuntu? Well, I'm on Kubuntu right now for the show, but I'm doing... I, I still have the Arch install. I just also have a Kubuntu install. So are you going to switch if you decided, like, hey, I'm going to switch to Arch officially, or are you now entering the distro hopper phase where you're going to try a bunch of distros out and be like, I don't like this, now I like this? Well, I mean... I mean eventually wind up on Watch. I mean, yeah. I'm on the, the hopper phase really right now. I mean... Okay. okay. Well, so I don't, Arch in six to nine months. Maybe I haven't. I haven't decided. There's there's too many options. There's too many great options to pick just one. So uh, even though I already had picked one, but that whatever. <laughs> but I think I think that it's 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 just it's just amusing to me to, to see like like once you go from having Kubuntu and everything's set up, and then you go into like the vanilla ones. Like oh man, I see why people have a problem with it. But still, I I think that it's still a great DE. But anyway, so I do have like a lot of other things, and I just want to report back. The NAS still hooked up, still being used. There you go. Oh, my gosh. That's why we didn't have to ask at the beginning of the show whether Michael has recording space. That may be a thing of the past we, now. Exactly. I'm solving problems one... One uh, year one, at a time. We are, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give you a tip for your next KDE. Um, do Arco Linux D, and then chuck on Eric's version, and see if you like that. Interesting. I might check that out. So, Noah, what have you been up to this week? Obviously, you're not at your normal studio. I'm not. I'm in an RV. It's Memorial Day weekend, so I'm out with my family. And uh, I told them, they said, we want to we want to go out for a weekend, Noah. We want to have a family time together. We want to disconnect from the world. I said, absolutely. Let's go out to the middle of Lake Bronson, Minnesota. It's going to be a great time. We're going to hang out. We're going to do campfires. And so we've had a great weekend. And so we got to Sunday, and I said, all right, everybody out of the RV. And they said, why? I thought we're connecting. We're being disconnected. We, we are connecting. We are disconnecting. Now get out of the RV so I can talk about Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to connect and talk about Linux. Right. And disconnect outside by the campfire while I talk about No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, so yeah, we're out, we're hanging out. But the most exciting thing has happened to me this week. And I, I, I would I could fill up the rest of the Destination Linux show talking about this, but I won't out of courtesy for all of the great stuff that we have to talk about. Instead, I'm going to devote my entire show on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central to talking about this in more detail. What I set out to do was to reinvent my trust for technology because what I realized was that I stopped using technology as much as I used to 10 years ago mostly because I don't trust it anymore. I'm so afraid of putting intimate thoughts of putting um you know my brainstorming and putting myself out there on a device because if that information were to ever get out um all of a sudden there could be I don't know, pictures of me in a pink swimming suit in the middle of Linux Fest Northwest. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that can get onto the internet when you're not careful. Right. And so, and so anyway, so what I, I did, I realized, you know, and it's really, Ryan, I have you to thank for this because, you know, when you and I talk about things, even though I'm always going to defend the fact that I, 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 I'm not going to be an Apple user. When you and I have these discussions, it does it does grate on me a little bit. When you say you have no idea the things that I have seen and, and, and the level to which that, privacy is being compromised. And I don't know exactly what all of that means, but I know that I trust you enough that I don't want to put anything private on this phone. So what I've done is I've taken this piece of crap Android Google Pixel phone, and I've essentially thrown it to the side, and I've started to use this device. Now, this this is the Sony Xperia XA2. And the reason that I'm using the Sony Xperia XA2 is because it's not running Android, it's running Sailfish OS. Nice. Now, Sailfish OS, uh, like I said, I could spend an entire hour talking about how great Sailfish OS and how much I love it. But suffice to say for Destination Linux, suffice to say this, if I go into my utilities folder and I open my file browser, 
Does anybody notice anything about that file, about that directory structure? Does that look familiar to anybody? It looks it looks a little bit like Android. It mu- what? <laughs> desktop documents, downloads, music, pictures, playlists. Like public- a desktop. Oh, it's like it's a home directory on Linux. Well, that's because it actually runs Linux. And so when I first booted this thing up, I, I bought this device with the intention of being able to store notes securely. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to store n- pictures and I wanted to store notes in an encrypted file system that I could trust. Well, guess what? This thing ships with Lux. So I trust Lux. I trust Lux because I encrypted my hard drive at one point with Lux. And I knew some things about the password. I had just forgotten the password. And I sent it into a forensics recovery firm that we have contracted with before uh, for client data. And I said, I this is not going to be that hard because I actually know a lot of things about the password. I know how many characters there is. I know roughly what it is. It's just the, the man, if yeah. I know that much about the password and it was it was an OK password, but it was not like the you know 46 character password that you would think of when you like you really want to encrypt something. They couldn't break that in Lux. And that really set me back. And I went, wow. And so I started to look at vulnerabilities that were published for Lux. And it turns out there aren't many. And they get patched very quickly when there are. And I, I said, okay, I trust Lux. Well, this thing ships with Lux. And I'm like, that's amazing. So I, 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 I load Sailfish OS on it. By the way, the instructions are fantastic from, from the Yala site on how to load Sailfish onto one of these things. When I went to do Android side loading, I would get, if I was going to load Lineage, for example, which I've done, um, the instructions are something like, plug your phone in and unlock the bootloader. Then, like, okay, uh, well, I guess let's Google how to do that, right? No. Right. Sailfish, it's plug the USB cable into the bottom. Hold the volume up button and turn it on until the light turns blue. Go over to your computer and execute this command at this shell script inside of the... And they have, like, everything, like, step by step. And I got done, and I was just... It was monkey see, monkey do. Do that, do that, do that, do that, do that, do that. And they're like, you're done. I'm like, okay, now what? And I look over, and it says Sailfish OS is booting up. I'm like, awesome! So the thing boots up, and the first thing I notice when it boots up is it, it, I see that home file system, and I went, whoa, I have a home directory. And so I go to look at some of the features and functionality of it, and I go to look how there is to back up and restore and what cloud-connected services are there that I might want to shut off. Well, guess what? There are none. The way you back up the device is you put an SD card in it, and you click backup, and it tars your home directory and puts it over onto the SD card. Why? Because all of your data is stored in an encrypted uh, in in your encrypted home directory. In my case, it's on the SD card. And so the, the fact that all of that is a, a basic Linux system was awesome. And I started to look at, I want to put music on it, right? I thought, okay, I'll have to find some sort of transfer MTP protocol thing. Well, it supports MTP, but you know what else you can do? You can just SSH into it. Yeah, there's, a div- there's an option inside of the, um, inside of the settings that, that, and, and I, I was looking inside of the settings to see if I could find something that would allow me to move files. And I come across this that says enable remote, uh, enable remote, uh, remote connection. That's and so cool. one of, and, and it gives you an IP address for the USB interface. So if you have it plugged into USB, you can SSH in that way, or you can obviously turn it on uh, over LAN and enable SSH that way. It generates a, a, a unique root password every time you do that. So if you forget and you leave it logged on uh, or leave it enabled, nobody else is going to be able to log into the thing after whatever the timeout is. Like everything about this this device is awesome. It is it does not feel like a phone. It feels like a little mini desktop that fits inside of my pocket that has all of the security and stuff that I trust with Linux. Now, I'll be the first to admit this can never replace an Android phone. It doesn't have the Android app. I mean, it does, but they don't work very well. Android app ecosystem, and by the time you get that stuff on there, now you're compromising security. So I don't look at it as a phone. I just look at it as as a seven inch computer that fits inside of my pocket. And I, I, I I've done all of my work on that this week. Everything from terminal work to file work to reconfiguring servers with NFS shares, all of that I did on this stupid little thing that I bought for $200 off of eBay and reloaded with a $49 operating system from Yala. Well, that was an extra process because you had to go through a VPN, but $49 operating system. That is the best mobile interface I have ever used in my entire life, bar none. Um, and so I'm going to continue to play with it. Like I said, I'll have a full review and a full feature set and, and all of the things that uh, on, on Tuesday. So if you want to check that out, you can. There, there are just so many things that Yala has gotten right. And the way that they have done things are just incredible. It has repos. It accepts RPMs. I, I couldn't find how to install a piece of software. I was like, I wonder how I get that. And somebody just goes, well, just install the RPM. 
I'm like, excuse me? They're like, yeah, just download the RPM and install yeah, it. Wow. Tap on the RPM. It installs. I added a repo. All of the menus, what's the biggest problem of using a phone, right? It's too big. I have small hands. I can barely touch a quarter of the screen, right? With Yala, you grab anywhere on the screen and pull down, and that's where your menu is. When you let go, it selects that menu entry. A brilliant interface. Just a- I don't have enough good things to say about this phone. Like I said, I'd eat up the rest of the show if I talked about it. That's what I went up to this <laughs> I think that's absolutely amazing. And, you know, I know this was actually torturing you because you were looking oh, yeah. at, hey, I'm going to get a digital notepad. Maybe I'm just going to get a regular notepad for my thoughts because there's nothing out there that really has this privacy element I, that you that you can really trust there to put your, your like you said, your thoughts and things that you're not wanting to share with everybody out. But mm-hmm. this is a really cool solution because, like you said, you're not trying to use it to replace your cell phone full time. Right. You're right. trying to use this as your device where you do, you know, the things on it that you need to keep secure, that mm-hmm. you need to keep private. And have you, though, with that, have you tried to put Ting in it or anything? Because mm-hmm. I noticed on Sailfish's website, as soon as I click buy, it says not available in your country. So right. I don't know if they work with. Yeah. So that's a funny story. It's, it's it, it has an easy solution. Um, so my first thought was, I said, okay, I couldn't buy it in the U.S. So I went on Yala Forms, which, by the way, the great thing about becoming a Sailfish OS user is you just inherit a group of friends. Like, Sailfish OS users are some of them, like, it's it's the whole joke, right? Somebody walked into a bar. What did they tell you first? It's a vegan. Like, it's that kind of thing, right? It, yeah. you, once you become a Sailfish OS user, you're really passionate about Sailfish OS. I jumped on the form, and I, you know, I just looked, and, and of course, there's a thread. Uh, how do I buy Sailfish OS from the U.S.? And there was a whole list of things so they said the easiest way is to find a friend in the uk zeb can you buy me selfish os and uh, but he wasn't <laughs> online and uh, i'm impatient so i was like okay so i go back on the forum and second option connect through a vpn just buy it there as long as it terminates in the eu so i'm kind of an idiot and i i, I like to do things the, the 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 difficult way so i spun up a digital ocean server in eu set up open vpn vpn <laughs> to my server and, uh, and purchased uh, <laughs> and then purchased Yala. So I, I buy Yala uh, and and um, the 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 issue with the OpenVPN, which it gets more complicated. But basically, they they are filtering out DigitalOcean IP addresses, and so I actually had to use private internet access to get it. But anyway, we uh, purchase the thing. They send you the the file that the install files. They send you all of the drivers that you need to to do all of the ADB stuff and all of the commands. They send you a PDF. When and when I say step by step, I mean step by freaking step my 70 year old mother who has never touched a, a, anything other than firefox could have done these if she could find the icons right that's how easy it is um and just fantastic support all of the yala apps are great the android ones are okay i had i put it on ting it worked fine I tried it on ATT, worked fine um all of the sim stuff seems to work just fine uh, the only issue I ran into is there is an Android compatibility layer, and so you can sideload APKs onto it. And in fact, you can even install the full-on Google Play services if you want. Um, that stuff does not work well. Um, and I don't care because I don't want a cell phone. I want a small laptop uh, that fits inside of my pocket. And so uh, I don't care that none of the Android stuff works very well, and I hope that they stop focusing on that and start focusing on making really awesome apps for Sailfish because the apps that do exist are so much far and away better than Android, you can't even begin to describe. Android, Every I feel like every app in Android is either clunky, is filled with ads, or something else, right? In Sailfish, all of the, the UI is forced. So you notice my background is this, you know, pretty blue background with this purplish tint. And inside of the ambience, you can set what color you want that, that UI to be. It, every app that you open forces that UI. So it has a transparent, yeah, I can see that background through the app. Every app looks the same, even though they're made by third party or they're made by all, they all look the same, which is great because it, all the menus are in the same place. The apps all function the same way. I, I, I tell you what, anybody who thinks iOS or Android is a superior operating system has to try, has to try Sailfish OS. And you will, un, I 100% guarantee you, you will admit this is a better way to use a mobile device. This is 100% a better way to use a mobile wow. device. The only problem is it doesn't have the backing that Apple and Android have. And so there's there are some bugs and there are some struggles that you go through, but uh, this is the most valuable, best money I've ever spent in my entire life on a piece of technology, bar none, to include my laptop, which in anybody that's been around me knows I haul that stupid thing everywhere, right? Not anymore. Now I take this. Very cool. Interesting. Love it. Okay, so moving on to um, this week's email, uh, we've got it, uh, an email from a very interesting character called Uncle Bonehead. 
I'm listening to you, your latest episode, and <laughs> screaming at my phone. You guys, along with the other creators, are not grasping the concept of federation, especially when it comes to PeerTube. The idea is for everyone to host your own instance, then follow everyone else. That strengthens a network as a whole, which will increase the views. Since you run your own instance, you control your data. You don't run the risk of saving or doing something that you would that would get your video removed. People complain that there are no viewers or creators on PeerTube, but either don't put anything on it themselves or put the exact same videos on it that they put on YouTube, leaving absolutely no compelling reason to go to PeerTube to watch it. He then goes on to say, then I see creators complaining they won't make any money using PeerTube. You can have any sponsor you want. Promote what you want. It's your instance. Do what you want. That's all down to you as a creator. But the biggest thing is that the audience doesn't know about PeerTube. It's up to the creators to tell their audience where to find exclusive content from them. You have to give people a reason to make the switch. Anyway, that's enough for now. I've got to get back to work. Love this episode. Dalton makes a great host, uh, guest host, and you have to have him back to talk more about UB ports. Well, I like the ending. <laughs> I um, like the ending. I think you kind of misinterpreted what we said, though. Like, we didn't say that people shouldn't host on PeerTube, that it's not a valuable thing, or any of that, or that you can't monetize. What we said was it limits the amount of eyeballs that can discover you, which is true. Yeah, like, look, there, there's a there's a whole thing in into this that if you're not creating content, you can't really understand fully. Yeah, and, and what I mean by this is, you know, the decision for me to change my tech channel to be solely focused on Linux, and anybody else who's done the same thing, you're automatically guaranteed to really never get past, let's say, the the most subscribed to Linux personality out there. I think has 80 or 100,000 subscribers. You're never going, but most of your Linux creators are sitting at four or 5,000. Look at Rocco, how much, how big he is in the Biddle community. Michael, you've got what, you know, 16,000, something 11. like that, 11,000. I've got 8,000 people. Like we're impressed with these numbers in the Linux world. Right. But outside that, the people doing Mac OS videos, the people doing Windows videos, they're sitting at millions of subscribers. True. So, then if you tell me as this Linux creator where I've already kind of taken my channel and made it so that pretty much at this point, I'm never going to achieve that million subscriber moment because nobody in Linux has ever broken 100,000 that go on PeerTube where there's even less people to watch and even less people. So I can tell my 8,000 people who maybe a couple thousand watch my video here and there to go to PeerTube where I do post it. But for me to make that additional sacrifice where now I need to go find my own sponsors on my own, make no ad revenue, which by the way, I donate all my ad revenue back to open source from YouTube, but to, to get no money from that on PeerTube, it, it's, it's not saying it's not a good option. I'm not saying it's not a great thing to have out there. What I am saying is that the audience actually has to support Linux people out there. Like we get a thousand times more downloads in our podcast than we have anything to do with YouTube or video or anything. But the sure. people who use Linux do not support you know, video content out there like other operating systems or technical groups support the content creators of their operating system. Respectfully, Ryan, I don't even think it's that complicated. It, 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 I think it, it boils down to this. You have person A. Person A wants to get into Linux. So person A goes to the same place that they go for everything else, and that is YouTube. That will never be PeerTube. It will never be PeerTube, at least not in any time in the near future, okay? So right now, the average person who doesn't know anything about technology, who wants to learn, goes to YouTube. That's where people go to learn how to fix the fridge, how to fix the car, and it's where they go to learn about Linux. And so they sit down at YouTube, and they're going to search. Now, yes, you're right. Once you have an audience... You can move to whatever platform you want. Heck, you don't even need PeerTube. We can go encode HTML video and put it on their site. That's what I've done with Ask Noah, right? right. I don't publish to – I mean I put it on YouTube again for the discoverability, but the vast majority of my audience, the vast majority, like in the tens of thousands, downloads from 
uh, from our, our podcast feed. And that feed is hosted by me and controlled by me, and I can put it wherever I want. Once you have an audience, you have that luxury to say, I'll put wherever yeah. I want. But it, but we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is discoverability. And eyeballs into the discoverability exist on YouTube. And that's not something that any one content per- creator can change it's something that uh, we as a whole youtube would have to go under and then everybody would have to go over people that are interested not interested in linux would all have to come over to peer tube if that happened then what you're saying makes sense because now we can start creating content there and have the possibility of people at least discovering that content yeah i think that there's also the, the there is one point that he did make that was very interesting and i think that is you know, a valid point in the sense of making exclusive content for the platform uh, for, or peer tube would make more people want to go to the peer tube, but it also would limit the amount of people who watch that specific content because peer tube is not that is not very big at all. But at the same time, the idea that peer tube is federated and you can follow everyone else, yeah, but you don't advertise peer tube. You don't say go to peer tube. There mm-hmm. is no way to go to peer tube. You have to right, specify right. a specific instance. And then you're only promoting that instance. So if you created right. your own peer tube, you're only benefiting yeah. yourself because yeah. in order to find other people on peer tube, it's a lot more complicated than just going to the thing and searching. It's like mm-hmm. saying it's like saying go to our Cody MD and 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 check out the show notes for this week. Which Cody MD? Which IP address did you install it on? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's not a thing. It's it, it, peer peer tube is a software package. It's not an ecosystem. Right. Uh, it, not yet. So uh, same thing with Mastodon. Maybe, you say which which Mastodon sure. are you using? Yes. And everything. But you know, and and to be clear, that may change, right? It, I, I in fact, it will change it, within the next ten to fifteen years. I app, I hundred percent believe YouTube is not going to continue to be the dominant platform. Frankly, because so many people are unhappy. No, I've yet to meet somebody that's on YouTube that's like, man, YouTube is a great platform. Everybody's mad about something. I, I had to fundamentally revamp my show. We purchased music that was licensed, put it in, ran the first 50 episodes and found out that YouTube was just not going to let us use that music. Why? We don't know. Their content ID system flagged it. So I had to pay a a music composer to custom write a piece of music for my intro just so I could publish onto YouTube. That's the level of idiocy that we have to, that we have to fight to be on that platform. So nobody is is happy to be there. Believe me, Mm -hmm. but that's where the eyeballs are. So that's where we are. Well, you know, I think it's a couple of things. I think number one, the community Linux community needs to support content creators out there a little more in those arenas. I mean, we have to put it back on and say, listen, everybody freaked out when Linus talked about Linux one time in his, what, thousand videos because he has a million subscribers. Why don't we have anybody in the Linux arena at all that has any type of pool like that? Because nobody goes there. But you could say, well, go to PeerTube because it's a privacy thing, except Nobody goes there either. Chris Weir, all these people are on PeerTube, have been on PeerTube from the very beginning. They have like a couple hundred subscribers there. So if the community doesn't follow the creator, then we can't we can't expect the creator to just move off of platforms where they're going to have exposure. Right. The community has mm-hmm. to get involved and back yes. people. You have people and, and in this community who've been creating Linux videos for 10 plus years who are sitting at five, 6,000 subscribers at best. They have no mm-hmm. audience. Right. And this actually and, hurts Linux because they're the yeah, only people yes. marketing Linux. Right. And there's, But there's another there's another classic example. Okay, f- forget PeerTube at the moment. Another big community is Twitter. But I know a couple of people who have tried to leave behind their 6,000 subscribers on YouTube and said, right, I'm doing all of my content now on Twitter. And a month later, they're sitting there at 300 subscribers and they go, oh, I've had enough of this. I'm going back on YouTube because even their dedicated followers. I think you mean won't. Twitch, by the way. Not Twitch. Twitch. That's no. what I meant. Yeah, not Twitter. Yeah, Twitch. Yeah, Twitter does bad. have their Twitter does have a tie into Periscope, so there are people doing that exact thing actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah but 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 you're right, Michael. I did I didn't mean, did mean Twitch, and they've gone across there. Only ended up with maybe a maximum of 500 views. And I've got no, this is not working. I've got to go back to YouTube because my people aren't watching me. And Twitch is Twitch. At least is there's just one Twitch, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think I think that I think that topic it, we're not trying to beat you up. What we're trying to say is that the I think that topic is just far more nuanced than than we maybe made it out to be. And maybe it sent the wrong message. And like Ryan so eloquently said, the that those nuances become very clear when you when you are a content creator from the outside. It maybe isn't as obvious. Yep. So the next email for this community feedback this week is from Rhett. He says, uh, hello to the greatest minds ever to discuss Linux, except Michael. Wait, what? I'm pretty sure it said especially Michael on that. 
I'm pretty sure it didn't. I read that email. I'm pretty sure it said especially. I'm going to go yeah. check to make you sure. Read the, you read the email. You can check after the show. I'm, I'm going to check it but while we're doing another segment just to prove the point. Anyway, <laughs> I, I just listened to episode 135. This is great job. I wanted to bring you to your attention that I went to Cell 2019 in Charlotte with the hopes to meet you guys, but I chickened out when I saw you guys in person and did not introduce myself. I was going to have wow. you uh, autograph some books on Unix and stuff. I regret not coming up and saying hi, so I was just a bit in- intimidated, and it was my first Linux Linux Fest ever. So before we move on to the rest of the email, I just want to say, if you ever want to see us, if you ever see us in public, I think all all of us would equally say, just come up to it and, and just kind of, you know, introduce yourself. Absolutely. We'd love to meet you. I mean, mm-hmm. the thing is, I mean, it's like self, take self for 2019 this year. Right. I'd say only th- maybe three out of every ten people that came up to us, we actually like yelled at or hit. So like. <laughs> <laughs> Like everyone, that, was my, that was my bad. Sorry, boys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, though, uh, here's what you do. If because uh, you know what, I, I am a person that um, uh, people wouldn't know this about me because I kind of put my, myself up there, right? But I, I'm an introvert, and so I I I I, I, I like to my I recharge by being uh, away from other people and stuff like that. So I understand that that social anxiety of like I'm going to approach these people that, and it's always a one way street, right? Because you feel like you know us really, really well because you watch us week after week, and then you say, well, they don't know me from John, and you know, and so that that can be an intimidating factor. And so what I found is a really awesome way to to break that barrier is to food. say I use Arch. You could say that, and that will get you hit. That's where the three. <laughs> <of> the <three. laughs> <laughs> no, but that is food, right? Uh, we always go out to food. Everybody's got to eat. It's not weird to eat because we all eat. And so uh, just come join us for lunch and come hang out and then uh, and, and just approach us like you would approach any other person that you would just bump into on the street, right? Come hang out with us. Come get dinner. In fact, if mm. you tell me that you're there, I'll even buy you lunch. How's I'll tell that? you the few times that I was asked to sign an autograph were like moments of pure incredible joy like oh my god somebody actually cares enough that they would want me to sign anything um it's amazing so don't be intimidated by that definitely come up and talk to us believe me you're making our day by that you are very much so because you have because here's what you have to understand for every one person there is of you that's like man i really wanted to meet you and i really appreciate what you do there's a hundred of people that write in and say you know what kind of garbage that you guys put out exactly. on YouTube? I, I've got called so many names in the book. I can't share most of them on the air. The one I can share that was kind of <laughs> funny. I got called a imported rice bowl and that I should go back to, wow. uh, to my home country and, and, and go work in a sweatshop rather than uh, make videos because they'd rather <laughs> listen to Dead Silence than listen to me ramble. And, wow. uh, and so, so, wow. so but no, but you get that harsh things. Like, like, come on. All, you guys are all acting like, oh, you've never seen it. They're like, yeah, you have. I've never experienced that today. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Michael right. had this one this week, uh, Noah, to your point. And I've had one. I've had more than one. I've had tons. But right. that one is actually particularly bad, the one you got there. that, that That's shocking to me. It just, it's just one that comes to mind. But the point is that they, what I'm trying to say is that there are – we get so – there's people are very quick to speak up negatively. And I want to be clear too, right? I appreciate negative feedback. I do because even that person as – as horribly worded as it was, it gave me something to think about. I am doing something that this person doesn't appreciate. Is there a way that I can modify the content to be entertaining to that person? Uh, and, and if so not, I, is there a way to, to magnify it so to be more annoying to that person? <laughs> so I, I, we try to pay attention to those things. But what you have to understand is it, – it, and this is basic psychology. For every one downer you get, it takes five uppers to feel like balanced. If I get five positive comments and one negative comment, I feel like it was 50 – that's psych, – psychology – tells us yeah. that the person interprets that as 50% of people liked it and 50% of people didn't like it. And so it, it, like Ryan said very well, it would make our day to be able to meet you, to shake your hand and, and, and to know that we're not wasting our time here, that, that there are people out there that appreciate it. Because what you have to understand is for every one person of you, there's five people out there that tell us they don't appreciate it. And so we do appreciate when people uh, come up and in our, in our, in our, uh, you know, introduce themselves and, and hang out. Absolutely. We would love to. Yeah. Now, if you want to hang out with Noah for lunch, just know that he chooses literally Chinese. the worst Chinese Chi- restaurant. No, 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 no. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to reach through this camera. <laughs> I don't care what Chinese. Re- I just wanted to go to a Chinese buffet. That's all I said one time through the entire weekend. Can we go to one Chinese buffet? And so we go to a Chinese restaurant that didn't have a buffet. And it was it was all right. You didn't come. So I don't know what you're talking about. The second time I did finally get to go to a Chinese buffet and it was great. But again, you had already left. So no Chinese for you. I just wanted to- <laughs> <laughs> no but, Brett, There's no need to be intimidated because he won't bite your head off. Honest. Yeah. 
Exactly. Most days. He won't reach through the camera just, just unless it's Ryan. To strangle you. <laughs> <laughs> just don't challenge my Chinese, that's all. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so he, he continues on to say, uh, I have a question about shell scripts. How do I even begin to learn how to write a bash or shell script for doing, like saying doing backups and stuff? Do you have any recommendations for books or videos? I need to step up my first script game fast. So thanks for all that you guys do, and I look forward to the show every week, and it brings me happiness. Shell scripts are nothing more than automating shell commands, right? And so what I would suggest, anytime I'm looking to script something, the way that I, the process I always go about is first, I do it by hand. I open up a terminal and I start typing the commands that I need to to execute a given action. <clears throat> now, once that if, that, if all of those work and I verify that, yep, okay. So I'll give you an example. You talked about backup, right? Here's, here's the most basic backup script you can write. rsync space tac. Uh, AVZ space, the source space, the destination. Understand what, so if all, all you did was put that into a, a text file and saved it as backup.sh, you would have a backup script and then make it executable. And you have a backup script and it will back up your files. If you want to get more advanced, like let's say you want the first the source directory to also delete anything that was deleted in the source directory, you also want to delete in the Destination directory, you would add the com- the um, the option tac tac delete after so it would be tac avz space tac tac delete, and so I would run that command just inside of it. I type it out inside of a shell, and if that worked and it did everything I wanted it to do, then I would then I would put it into a document and save it as something dot sh, and and then you can use cron or whatever to automate that process to run, and that's a very basic shell script. Once you start getting into more advanced, which I'm assuming is what you're talking about. Once you start getting more advanced stuff, I wouldn't necessarily say there's any particular book that you should see or any particular tutorial that you should see. I, I, I would suggest you start to step through in your mind how you want something to be more efficient. So, for example, hey, I want the this particular file to get backed up, but the date changes every single day that I can use to represent the current date so that I can append the current date to my backup file name. So it's instead of just saying backup.tar, it's, you know, uh, 0901-2019 dash backup dash tar or dot tar. Um, and, and, and so, so that, that would be my, my suggestion is following that process. Obviously there are a ton of books on regular expressions. There are a ton of books on, on bash variables. Uh, there are a ton of books on scripting itself. So you, because you can do loops and all sorts of crazy things, but if you just want to get started, uh, I would suggest spending some time in the terminal, figuring out what you want to do, because it's an easy thing to do. I want to do this thing. Google it. I want to do this thing in the CLI. Okay, here's the command to do that thing. All right, great. Now I can script it. Um, that That's how I go through the process of scripting things, and I do it a lot. I just want to focus mm-hmm. on that point you made there, because this mm-hmm. helped me tremendously when I was trying to learn bash scripting, is you have to have a problem to solve first. And he has a problem, and that is a great place to start. But you I find, at least for me, I have a ton of books here, big, giant volumes on different Bash script examples and all this stuff. And I've looked through them when I was trying to learn and reading the chapters verbatim and testing it out. But it doesn't really stick with you until you're solving an actual problem you have. So go look for those issues where scripting would make things faster for you. You know, doing backups for me uh, when I set up a new machine. I have scripts that run that do auto installs. I have scripts that run that set up my audio equipment. Things that you do on a normal, on a regular basis, just script it. And you'll learn scripting that way. And you'll start learning the tax and the different commands that you can add to it by solving your problems. And at least for me, I find I learn it better than just randomly looking at examples of right. options out there that mm. I'm not using. Okay. Right. So just a, just a quick question then to take that, that little bit further. Yes, we all know the type of commands that we want to type into a terminal. But where would you learn about something that says sleep space 2s? Because you'd never type that into a terminal, wouldn't you? You wouldn't well, type a terminal no, command that- telling it to sleep. So the basics of the types of additional commands that you could use in a shell script. Mm-hmm. So where would you get that? So, so again, when if you're if you're following my my carefully laid out process where you're opening a terminal and typing these commands out, I'll give you a perfect example. Our website, altaspeed.com. It is it's it's based on Nikolai, which means that I I write in Markdown and then there is an engine that takes that Markdown, ingests it, and spits out the HTML. And that engine that that conversion or process or whatever you want to call it, building is what we call it, has to be done every time we want to update the site. And if obviously that's a huge pain to write a Markdown thing, upload it, 
then go log into the server and then run the update command, right? And to, so it can rebuild the site and refresh those changes. And so we've scripted that. Uh, and part of that scripting thing, it, it, part of that process is you have to go into a Nikolai virtual environment in order to issue the build command. And you have to wait for that environment to load, which represents your, your sleep thing. And so what you find is if you enter the commands inside of a terminal, like I suggested you do, what you'd find is that they work. If you just copy and paste those commands into a text document and tried to run it as a script, you'd find that it didn't work. And so what I will do is... I will run the script by hand in the terminal. In other words, I take all the commands and put them into the terminal or into a script and then run that script. And what you find when it run when when that script is running, what you what you what you what you'll notice is you can watch the output in the terminal and you'll mm -hmm. see Nikolai says loading environment and before it even finishes, the script is trying to execute the next bash command because it just thinks it's in bash. The Nikolai command finished. It's time to continue on to the next uh, next thing, right? We don't need to wait. And so you go, oh, wait, it's entering that command before the environment's loaded. I need to slow it down. How do I make a command? Wait a minute. And then you can Google how do I make a command? Not, you know, wait for a couple of seconds and That's you'll arrive. Exactly at how I found sleep for my mm -hmm. install script. It was at right. one point moving too past the script. I looked up, how do I put a pause in a bash script? Found sleep, stuck it in there. Boom, fix my problem. So, so the answer to your question, Zeb, is run it, it, do it in the terminal, experiment in the terminal by hand. And here's the other cautionary tale I'll add on. You know, Ryan said, make scripts for anything that you do, you know, a repetitive. And that's great advice. However, I would tell you, don't use scripts that you don't understand what they're doing, because that will actually mm -hmm. hinder your ability to learn yes. use something so often that you're like, oh, LS, CD, ah, ah. okay, there we go. When you, when you get to that point that you're not even <laughs> thinking about it, you're just <laughs> typing it and it sounds like mm -hmm. animal grunting, like I just made, yeah. because you're so frustrated having to go through this boringly repetitive process again, that's the time to suck it into a script. Yeah. And that's exactly the same thing I did on a very, very simple script that basically does sudo apt update, sudo apt distribution upgrade, sudo apt auto clean, and, and various other bits and pieces. And I've just got a little four-line script now so that when I'm on a Ubuntu, update me after I've pasted it into the bash file, obviously. So I just type update me, and it does all of my things, and I just do those once a week now on my, on my distributions. Um, but one of the um, patrons is saying that there are plenty of bash cheat sheets out there True. that will give you a yep. hint at what some of those commands are yeah my desktop wallpaper is a is a is a bash cheat sheet yeah i mean I, I i think we might have a cheat sheet in the show notes as well when we get done with this nice so we want to try something different this week with your feedback send us a video comment showing us your tech favorite desktop comment or suggestions and we may feature it in a future episode Post it on YouTube, Peertube. You don't have to make it public. It can be in a video of you, a still picture, anything you'd like. But send us the link to the video. So to get the ball rolling on this new segment, the first 10 videos that makes it to the show will send you some of the free DL stickers and swag. So if you want some swag, include your address in your email where we can send it or where we, where we, where, yeah, so that we can send you the swag. So send your video links to comments at destinationlinux.org. And just to add, we did get a video comment this week, but we didn't put it in because of how long the show is going to be. But it was a longer video, so we'll probably be doing some editing on that one. But try to keep your videos short like the first one we had because that will really help us be able to include them in what, easier in the show. What would be a great time limit or what would be a great time segment if you if a video came in and it was X length? You're like, that's perfect. Yeah, Um Less than a minute, I would say. If you could do thirty seconds, or, or that'd be great. But if less than a minute, it would be also fine. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Now, DigitalOcean offers the best virtual private servers on the market. What's a virtual private server? It's a server that you can rent for darn near free. That's zero point seven cents per hour, or you can get started for five bucks a month. Imagine, just imagine if you could go out and rent a server for $5 a month. How many people don't know that? I run into clients all the time. I run into yeah. Linux Advocate all the time. And I tell them that I, 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 I spun up a server. And they go, what do you mean you spun up a server? You purchased a server and you turned it on? I said, no, I rented it for 5 bucks a month. They go, you can rent servers for $5 a month? I said, yeah, in any data center I want across the world. You need a VPN connection over in Europe? Hey, guess what? So you can get that with DigitalOcean because their data centers are everywhere, all SSDs inside of their servers, so you have amazing performance. And if you don't know what you might need a server for, guess what? They have over 2,000 
cloud agnostic tutorials so you can get an idea what you might want to spend money on. It's a great way to shop for us tech nerds. So you get started DigitalOcean. It gets even better. We're not going to make you spend the five bucks. We're going to give you one month for free at a $50 credit by going to do.co slash DL. Now, in addition to getting a really great deal on a world-class server, you know what else it does? It tells DigitalOcean, hey guys, we really like Destination Linux and we want them to keep making content, so keep giving them money. So you help us as you help yourself. Help us help you by going to do.co slash DL. Again, you can get started with DigitalOcean with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash DL. And a huge thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. With us today is a special guest, Emma Marshall from System76. Now, she has been at System76 for a long time. I've worked with her, what is this, Emma, now three iterations of various different organizations I've been with and, and working with you, talking about Linux and your passion for Linux and the work that you're doing with Linux, bringing it on the desktop to individual users. Welcome into the program. Thank you. I love watching you guys. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, tell us how you got started in Linux. Well, really, it was through System76. I wasn't using Linux uh, prior to that. I got started in open source um, using WordPress, and I really enjoyed working with the community and um, changing widgets, just having that freedom of functionality and the chats, making friends online over a, cer over a certain project that you both love. It was really neat to me. Um, and then finding System76, you know, the first thing they did when I got there is just throw me in to Ubuntu with no help. So <laughs> that's how I got into Linux. And then I just kind of stayed there ever since. Seems pretty, a pretty effective option. Um, yeah. So your SISM76 profile describes you as a Linux fanatic. What, tell us about what, uh, what about Linux made you a fan? Uh, the community. Um, basically, we had a little community at System76 when I started. Um, the Ubuntu local group was um, pretty active at the time. But just just sitting there watching the geeks have their arguments about the littlest things, but they were so <laughs> passionate about it and had so many facts and logic to back up why their um, device or their software was the best to use. Um, that just really was entertaining and it was addicting. I couldn't I could not stop listening and just reading the community posts online and following people like Jonah Bacon and um, Liz Crumbach. Uh, it just made me want to be a part of all of it. Very nice. So there are many people who talk about wanting to have a career in Linux. And obviously there's a lot of different paths to get a career in Linux. And we want to know about your path of how you, you know, ended up, working at System76. So what led up to the point where you you saw a position were able to get in and work on Linux full time? Well, I was writing for uh, newspapers, local newspapers. So writing is my, is my specialty in communication. Um, so they had a job posting. It was, it was mostly a customer service position, but it had some different positions. I could tell it was a small business because there were lots of things that were part of the customer service, like um, doing the social media and helping with marketing and um, helping organize a lot of different administrative tasks. So um, it wasn't just customer service, but um, I didn't really pursue a career in Linux. It was more of an open source um, but it was a lot of fate as well. Fate so you, you saw the small business posting and had you worked with bigger companies? Were you kind of afraid to take a chance on a small business at that time? Of course, now System76 has grown a lot, but. Yeah, I was a little scared. I mean, walking into the, the office at that time when it was so small, I was really confused. And there goes Noah's sheet. That was awesome. Yep. <laughs> um, I was yeah, it was a different environment for sure because I came from an, a company with 10,000 people and um, used to just seeing so many faces. But we walk in and I see just the logo and my desk and then everyone else is in their little tiny offices surrounding my desk. So it was a little overwhelming and confusing, but I felt like Carl's passion was enough to convince me that it was a legitimate business and that this is a thing that people are into online. Very nice. So I'm going to turn this next question into a, a double question, if I may. Um, first of all, who came up with the or, or with the title Happiness Manager? I did. 
<laughs> oh, you did. What, yes. what What was your title meant to be then at that time? Um, tech support manager. Um, mm -hmm. So basically all my roles have, I've thought that all my roles are basically keeping people happy. Um, so through learning customer service and marketing sales and then tech support, I finally settled on tech support and realized that this is where I can help the most people. And I can also be on social media and active in the community and then still be able to go to conferences and get to be close with all my nerds on my team. So it just seemed like that's what our main mission is and that's what our main mission should be. And that uh, hardware companies maybe don't focus on happiness as much. So a whole department focused on it is important these days. So you work at a hardware company. That means you have access to hardware, right? The One of the coolest things about ever, if, if anybody's ever toured System76 or been there is that you have like a legit showroom, even though you don't necessarily do street sales. Like it's not a common thing for somebody to come off the street and walk in and say, here, let me give you cash for a computer that you, that's not really your business model. But yet if people come to visit, they can see all of the hardware that's there. What's your favorite? Uh, right now, hmm. The Adder is really pretty, but I'm just in love with the Darter Pro and I'm super ready for an upgrade. So if anyone else is listening, Carl, I really <laughs> want to upgrade to the Darter Pro. So your favorite right now is the Darter Pro. Is that the one you got to play with, Zeb? It certainly is. And it's an excellent uh, uh, computer. It's just it everything gross. about it just worked. It was fantastic. So that was such a nice surprise that you set up for us, Emma, at Southeast Linux Fest, where we were able to give Zeb one of the uh, Darter Pros to spend the weekend with. That was awesome. Oh, right. yeah. I'm so sad that I missed that. I, um, I got broke broken right before that <laughs> conference. So I wasn't in a condition to travel, but I had booked everything and had every intention of hand delivering that to you, Zeb. And so we've discovered what your favorite kit is at the moment, but if we can go back to the happiness manager for the moment. So what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to satisfy yourself that, yep, I've done the best I can do today. What's, what's the day in the life of a happiness manager like? Well, I wake up and I go on Twitter first, of course, and I read as much happy things as I can. Um, I definitely will watch at least one kitten video a morning. Nice. Um, I like to uh, message people personally and just wish them a happy Monday or something. And then I will lean over and grab my laptop and uh, get on Slack and see if there's any escalated issues that can't wait until I brush my hair or my teeth. And I will end up working for about an hour in bed. Get to System 76 and I'll basically go wish everyone face to face a happy day. And then I'll go to my team and we'll, if they're off the phone, we'll have like a little huddle, just talk about the day and um, any cases that are still um, pending or outstanding that we haven't solved and what we can do to make it better. So we, we basically talk all day long after that um, throughout the cases. So we're all in a little bay and um, each case when it's solved, I think usually we'll, we'll have a pretty exciting conversation about it for a couple of minutes and then we'll all move on to the next case. Um, but a lot of the job is just communicating with everybody at the company and making sure that I'm doing the right thing, that our customers are getting the right treatment, and that happiness is the number one goal for everyone that works under me. Excellent. Nice. Uh, so you've also described System76 as like uh, one of the most amazing company in the world to work for. So any, what, in your opinion, makes it the, a great place to work? Our people, like we have the most ultimate Linux dream team you could ever imagine. Like this team was handpicked. It is just amazing. Everyone is so smart and we all fit together. We're all so different. It's like the weirdest puzzle you could ever think of, but it fits <laughs> so nice. well together. Um, so I think our, our community and our people um, that we're a family and we're all focused on one goal, I think is um, what makes us the strongest company and the most amazing company. Nice. So what I like about what you're discussing is System76 doesn't sound like one of the typical companies because I work a lot in corporate America that says the tagline, our employees come first, but then they have a horrible culture that doesn't exemplify that at all. 
Um, but it's a nice tagline. But System 76, it seems like they actually are doing things to make that culture a reality of employee first, such as things where you said, you know, you go around and say hi to everyone each morning. The title thing, happiness manager, is actually really important uh, about building a culture and something I've seen successful companies uh, try to reinvent their customer service by by ceasing to call their employees things like agents. And, you know, because it just, if you're just an agent, your customer service agent or customer service rep, there's really no accountability in that title at all. Yeah. And by calling somebody something simple like you changing titles to happiness manager actually does create a sense of ownership, right? Of making the people that you work with, the people that you uh, are your customers, your job, the ownership piece is that happiness. So I don't know if that was all intended in the plan, but years in working on turning around teams that are underperforming, those are the exact steps that I've taken in years to change teams so that they can work together. They do take ownership of issues. And I find it fascinating that massive multi-billion dollar corporations have an impossible time finding out how to do this. And System 76, you know, found out how to do it from a startup position in such an effective way. And I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think the difference is those, the companies that try to use it as a marketing tool, I think that's forced. Yep. And our culture is, is from the ground up, you know, it's molded, it's organic, it's not forced. Our culture is happy because we're all happy and we're all pursuing our passions. And I think that really uh, differentiates. Yeah. And also like just the, the part of the organic stuff. Uh, I actually had a trip into Denver a couple months ago and I, I knew that I was going to be there for at least a couple months and I totally forgot to tell them that I was going to be there until the day before. So I missed message to Emma and said, Hey, uh, would there be any chance I could come and tour the warehouse and stuff. And within like the turnaround time of like, they were like, yeah, of course. And then also when I got there, they had also did like uh, prepared lunch for the entire team to, to, to like, to be like, have to take a break and be and like, have like, let me have conversations with everybody there and stuff. It was, it was a fantastic experience that I gave them such great lead time to do <laughs> and they were to they were totally prepared to even handle that. So I was like, that's that's impressive. Very nice. And Emma, as a happiness manager, something that makes me really unhappy, and I'm hoping you can fix it, is the fact that Michael has a System 76 shirt and I don't. What? Well, I don't have your address. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna fix that. Well, it's. Cause... I mean, I'm, it's not like it's not like I'm wearing the shirt just to kind of like, you know, like brand place. I wouldn't do product placement anything. That's just cheesy. Oh my, look at that. He's got a <laughs> That's ridiculous. Now you know, now you know where the six cup went from the set. Michael nicked it. <laughs> if you, yeah, if you guys at System 76 have been looking for your cup, <laughs> it's at Michael's yeah. house. Michael's got it. <laughs> That's actually um a special edition gift that we give them tour. We give them a pop kit. That's that awesome. A lot of stuff that we don't bring to conferences that you can only get if you come see us. Very wow. Good. Excellent. So the Thaleo desktop that uh, announced with the, like all this different cool stuff, but recently, more importantly, AMD Ryzen was added to yeah. those desktops. And is there any chance that the Ryzen options would be coming for laptops? Please say yes. I haven't seen any um, ongoing conversations, so I don't have really a, a comment to just to say we haven't looked into it yet or made any company decisions about it. That's fair. Yeah, for those who aren't watching the video, basically she was winking the whole time. So the answer is <laughs> yes. Okay, that's not true. For those but. not watching the video, no, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> it was just my hope. It was my hope. Ryan is very upset by the fact that Intel continues to dominate Ryzen, and so what he has to do is make up stories about Ryzen taking over. That's how he. That's how he sleeps at night. That's how Ryan gets into heaven. Yeah, that's that's right. a little AMD baby over there. Okay. <laughs> With his team green um, color combination at the back. Hey, shut it. AMD's original color was green. All right. So bringing it back, Emma, what are some exciting things we can expect to see from you and System76 in the future? 
Well, I um, hopefully will be going to conferences again now uh, that my foot is a little better. And at System76, we're going to be focusing still on the firmware manager. And looks like the next major project is about uh, the disk upgrade feature. So I'm excited to see where we where we land with that. Um, we did just attend Guadec, and we have an open source firmware conference coming up. So once I, I would love to hear how Guadec went and see what projects arose from that, but I'm sure some more um, firmware work will come out of meeting with everyone at the open source conference. So I would just stay fo focus on how um, POP is going to improve and how we're going to change the open firmware space. Sounds good. Emma, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. We appreciate you, and not just you as a person, but all of the work that you've done for the open source community, the outreach that you've done, the fact that you welcome in people like Michael who are incapable of planning more than 24 hours in advance, and you take them in and give them a good tour of your facility and show uh, uh, you know all of the, the cool and Linux open source things. I think it takes a company, and I think it takes a certain amount of vision to step up and say, okay, the rest of the world is making money selling uh, Windows PCs, and we could totally make some money selling Windows PCs instead we're going to uh, essentially buy what we can buy, take these things apart, turn them into perfect machines born to run Linux, and then we're going to sell them at a reasonable cost to, 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 to people who need that kind of machine and need the support that surrounds it. And it doesn't matter if you've never touched a Linux machine before in your life or if you're part of a university system and you need clusters of them to run your program, System76 is there to provide that service and to provide that customer support and to provide that hardware and you guys have been around for a long time and I, i'm sure you guys are going to continue to do great things we appreciate you taking the time to join us on destination linux to talk to us about it well i appreciate you guys having me and um i can't wait to join you guys again after we have some more firmware advances and uh, more pop features coming out nice yeah, we'll get you back in the program soon yeah, and also just want to specify like pop is uh, is a good is a, a distro that i was impressed by because i don't like gnome and i actually enjoyed using pop Mm -hmm. He doesn't mm -hmm. use it now, but he likes it. Well, it's because well, it's Gnome still. <laughs> Listen, I, they I, made me a fan, you know, when they did the Ryzen fix in there. We joked about AMD earlier, but Pop mm -hmm. OS was into System76 was one of the first distributions out there to go in and fix the System D issue to allow third gen Ryzen's to boot. That was huge and actually allowed me to do testing and the videos mm -hmm. and the content that I wanted to create because no other distro even including Arch and the latest distros had done that to that point. System 76 was the only one that had done it. And that was a huge, to me, that, that I was always a fan of System 76. But at that moment, that's when I started contributing back to the program as well, because I just became such a huge fan that, to see that they were interested in things, you know, for the entire desktop experience of users and not just to benefit their own. Yeah, and we are listening all the time to the community. So everything we do is for you guys. We hear your requests, we know what features you're looking for, and uh, we have as you know, we have as much time as you guys. So we're getting it done. Just be patient if you are waiting for other features that we haven't done yet. Just keep watching because we're not gonna stop. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, did you say that uh, Ubuntu was a better operating system than Arch? Is that what I heard? No, I said Pop OS because Ubuntu didn't do it. Pop OS put it in Pop OS. Oh, Ubuntu right, okay. still hasn't put Pop it OS in Ubuntu. Pop OS is a better operating system. Than I mean, it's Arch. based on Ubuntu, but, yeah. but they're it's better the ones than Arch, though. No. Oh. <laughs> well, and I think that's, I think that's <laughs> what impressed great, me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard that there was an operating system better than Arch. At that particular time, it was. At that particular time, in fact, it, it was my favorite over Arch. And to this now that I actually switched to telling people now to use Pop OS. Because uh, I never tell anybody to use Arch. Because if you want to use Arch, you have to want to use Arch, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be an advanced user. But so for most people now, I say go Pop OS uh, right. because of the hardware compatibility aspect. Mm -hmm. That's what Arch gives that most of these distros based on Ubuntu do not, right? You get an Ubuntu, and if you have a three, four year old machine, fine, you're great. But if you have cutting edge hardware, it's not going to work because they don't update the kernels fast enough. The hardware sure. enablement stacks take six months. So, you know, yeah, if Pop! OS can stay on top of the hardware, I mm -hmm. think, in fact, they would be better than any of the rolling distros out there as well. Yeah. And they're getting close there because they were the Somebody first ones that, to drop this. You the next time he talks about You don't have to use it against me. I'll tell people straight out. Okay, all right. <laughs> I have no shame. I'm just saying. Yeah. Now, Michael will say that Pop! OS needs KDE desktop. Yes. He's right. <laughs> yes. Michael would be right. 
<laughs> that would be my distro. If Pop! OS had a Plasma version, that would be my distro. Yeah. I mean, you could I go. Know, with... Michael, we know. <laughs> <laughs> I probably send him a message every single yeah. week. And I don't think it needs it either, because one of the things that surprised me when I was using the Data Pro itself is I didn't give the OS a second thought because it just worked. I'd switch it on. I'd go to the application I'd want. I'd have no hassles about trying to remember how to get to it because everything was just so integrated with the hardware. I don't, um, I don't give the OS a, a second thought either. I just give the DE a second thought. So, it's... <laughs> <laughs> But no, yeah, it was a quality piece of kit, and I was, I was surprised at how good it was, in fact. Awesome. Well, we appreciate all the feedback you guys give. Cool. Michael, quit sending feedback. <laughs> I can't promise anything. It's okay. Right, we yeah. already muted his email from our <laughs> like years ago. We know, Katie. We get it. So, is this is this an, another elephant story, or is that the truth, Michael? You'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I was curious about why I didn't get a response last time. Yeah. <laughs> when you steal a cup from them, you know, <laughs> tends to lower your reputation. Well, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> So Microsoft loves Linux. This has been established. In fact, you may not know this, but they love Linux so much. They're giving us the Office Suite. They're open sourcing DirectX so we can play every game. They're shipping a new version of Windows 10 based solely on Linux kernel. They just love, okay, none of that's true. But what is true this week is that they have decided to gift us XFAT. So for those of you who are not dual booters, XFAT is Microsoft's file system. And they use this for millions of devices out there that have flash drives, SD cards, etc. Now, historically, Microsoft has used XFAT to collect massive licensing fees from vendors that include even Android out there. So now that they're a part of apparently, well, one of the rumors is one of the reasons they're doing this is because they're a part of the Open Invention Network. And mm -hmm. One of the packs that they have in there is to have non-aggressive patents out there. And obviously, this is considered a aggressive patent. Probably the issue here, though, is that um, the Linux developer community doesn't really like the code too much. Um, so Christopher Helwig, a longtime Linux developer, called it a pile of crap, saying it basically <laughs> is a re-implementation of FSFAT, uh, not to... Uh, not up to kernel standards with a few indirections thrown in to also support XFAT. So no amount of work on this code base is really going to bring us forward. Uh, Greg Hartman, who we know works on the Linux kernel, directly states that uh, the code is horrible, and he knows it's horrible. Uh, but they will <laughs> this is bring a real it... gift Microsoft has given us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but they will bring it forward into staging, and if people want, just ignore that it's there and exists. So I guess in what I've been able to get from the news articles out there is Microsoft took the code as is, threw it out there and said, hey, if you want to go do something with it, go ahead. But we're not going to write anything special for Linux. We're not going to make it work. You guys go do the work. We're just basically making it. And it's not open sourced, but they're making it uh, a part of this OIN sharing license yeah. agreement so that Linux can include it into the kernels there. I, I just want to make sure I understand this. So um, if I want a non-journal file system that's invented by Microsoft, primarily designed to run on Windows, not very well, that crashes often, loses files sometimes if the drive isn't ejected properly because of reasons, uh, a crappy <coughs> code base, a patent uh, uh, humbled invention license, which apparently isn't open source, but they're going to give it away somehow, then I can use XFAT? Yeah, and you'll love all of those. Those are features, is what we call them over at Microsoft, is right. features. Right. So, or it's the question. X4 and have none of those problems. Understood. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, you said that they might be doing it because it's this non aggressive, uh, non aggression patent pact. Does that mean everything that they've got has now got to be? non-aggressive or they just had to offer up one sacrificial lamb oh, well thing. basically being a part of the oin network it means that you're putting in the your patents so that everyone who's a part of that network can benefit from those patents and it technically doesn't say that all people are benefiting from the patents and if you're not a part of that network you don't necessarily have a guaranteed right to use that stuff patent you know hassle right. for but that's yeah, not but, all in as well one would have thought that something like direct tax was patented up to the hill are they going to release that now because they're part of this but no because they don't necessarily have they 
they don't that stuff is not being utilized by other companies in the same way that X Fat was. So they were taking right. advantage of the X Fat usage because like Android was was having support for X Fat, so they were charging mm-hmm. them fees in order to do so. And in gotcha. the case of like DirectX, let, they don't really have to do that kind of so, thing. So so let, let's break this down a little bit because I think we're there's a little bit of confusion. So the 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 reason that the XFAT thing is important, right? It's the only file okay, let's start here. FAT is the only file system that works between Linux, Mac, and Windows and on all the mobile operating systems. So it makes sense if you want your device to be able to plug it into any computer that you'd run it on FAT. The problem with FAT is it doesn't support file sizes larger than two gigabytes. So that's where XFAT comes in. It's a, it's a, it basically an extended version of FAT, XFAT, and allows you to have larger file sizes. I think those work up to something like ungodly sized files. Uh, and, and, and you can do that on XFAT, but the problem is it doesn't have any of the features that modern file systems that handle large files have. And so it breaks constantly and busts things right and left because it's been tied up in a, in a patent licensing thing for some time, anytime you wanted to read an XFAT system on Linux, you had to install an additional package because the, the system wasn't able to, to read it out of the box. With direct stat- so, so, so that is marginally beneficial to us as Linux users because at least now we don't have to install that extra package assuming that that gets packaged into the repos. The DirectX thing is like, that's far less valuable, right? The reason they're op- the reason they're contributing DirectX is because nobody likes it. Nobody cares about it. It sucks, and it's being replaced by things like Vulkan, and those things are, are making like leaps and strides a- a- ahead of what Direx could be. And every time I watch a video review on a game, and this is coming from the non-gamer, I watch a video review on a game, they're like, we tried this thing on DirectX, and it did blah. And then we went over to Linux, and we tried, and, and it was, you know, 30 frames per second faster, and blah, 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 you know? It's a bad product, and it's not great, and it's not competitive, and it's slowly losing it, 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 the advantage that it did have uh, over time. So I, I couldn't possibly care less about DirectX except for the fact that maybe it brings some software that we weren't ordinarily able to run on Linux, and I care a little bit more about XFAT, but still not really. So there you go, though. What we have determined is Microsoft has a complete devotion to Linux. There's nothing to, com- nothing to worry about here. <laughs> Absolutely. There's not be any type of move that Multi-billion would be- dollar company, and they contributed an outdated crappy file system and an outdated even crappier rendering engine. Which yeah. proves well, they the care. Thing, you know, last week we did, when you were missing, we, you, know, you, didn't, you, you didn't show up on the show, and I did tell people, I know you told me to keep this private, that you're now a devoted WSL user. As a WSL user, are you very yep. ex- how excited are you about having XFAT in the compatibility layers here now with your Windows? Well, it's going to be nice because uh, you know when I open Windows Explorer and try to browse my my SD card, you know, frequently what will happen is it'll say it's done writing a file. I go to eject the card and pull it out, and I've lost my file. So now that I can do that in WSL, at least I won't lose all of my pictures anymore. So that'll be a massive improvement over their crappy operating system. Fantastic. Sometimes I'll just move over to Linux and not have any of those problems, but. Until then, <laughs> The Pinebook Pro is available. Well, not really, but it was available. <laughs> if you miss the small little tiny window that you had to open it, then it's no longer available. But that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing, and here's why. The Pinebook Pro is quickly establishing itself as one of the most uh, awesome laptops ever to run Linux in its own way. And much like this little thing that I was talking about at the beginning of the show, Selfish OS, the Pinebook Pro fills a unique um, area. And that unique area is this. And I've been there as has as I know, Michael, you've been there as well. I'm traveling for business. I've got my full on laptop. It's my big, you know, I've got my multiple desktop environments and I've got my multiple uh, activities and I've got all my software loaded and I've got everything is set up. Right. But it's big and it's bulky and it's whatever. The thing about the Pinebook Pro is it's a very inexpensive device that has all of the modern features. So if you want a second laptop or if you want a backup laptop, or maybe if you have light needs for a laptop because you do all of your device on one of these crappy things, the Pinebook Pro is a device that is going to fill that need for you. And, uh, and so it, but it has all modern hardware, high resolution display. It has type C charging. It has type C ports. So all the modern things that you would want inside of a computer, unsurprisingly, because it's such an awesome product at such a low price, they sell out quickly, like within a day. And so they sold out. They were going to have another run in September. That sold out. They're going to have another run in October. So you'll have to wait for that. Uh, watch for the October 
a, a sale and you might have an opportunity to purchase a Pinebook Pro, I absolutely will purchase a Pinebook Pro. I'm going to try a different route. There are people that buy them at their cost and then they upsell them at a surcharge on eBay. And I'm going to try and buy one that way. If that doesn't work, then I will try to purchase one uh, in the in the October run. But absolutely fantastic device. Michael, you have the original Pinebook. I have played with the original Pinebook. Yep. I've not played with the Pro, but I have high hopes for this device. And I think it's very cool that the company that is behind the Pinebook Pro takes a very active stance in trying to ensure that they are being a good community member and a good steward of the open source community. And I think that's very valuable as well. Yeah, and they're also doing a process. Uh, they announced recently that they're going to be doing uh, giving away Prime books to needy, needy organizations and stuff based on the benefits of the sales of the Pine phone and all this other stuff. They're like they they've they've they're not they're only focusing on the digital divide to be yes. specific, which is probably one sure. you know, the thing I'm most passionate about in tech right now is closing really? the digital divide. It's I've been a part of other um, communities, other charities revolving around closing the digital divide and when i found out pine 64 is doing this as well i purchased one immediately so i was one of the lucky ones that got my order in but any because they're also going to be doing a program michael that you're going to talk about where they're giving sets of pine books out right to families that uh need them the most that can't afford the price they're, they're doing a lot of cool stuff and one of the things that they're doing is like like us like he you said that they're taking uh they're taking the Pine Book as being a way to help with the digital divide by whenever they have enough money from the Pine Phone sales to be uh, covering the cost of a Pine Book, they will be taking that money and then uh, sh sending out Pine Books to people who it could be individuals, it could be organizations that are for like you know charity organizations, it could be all kinds of different places. And one of the things that's really cool is that they're going to be uh, selecting uh, a be benefits to. The uh, like they're going to be selecting their own organizations that they want to give it to, but also are going to take uh, community involvement and ask people who you know give them suggestions of who they'd want to send these product these products to and that kind of thing. And another thing about that is that the, like all the money that comes from the Pine Phones are going to be directly sent to the Pine Book uh, or like the campaign of helping this digital divide issue. So if you buy a Pine Phone, you're also helping. Uh, facilitate that as well. So, like, they're doing so many cool things about it. Not only making great, like, these great products, and I have a Pine Book original, and I'm a fan of it, and I can't wait to try the new Pine Book Pro because, like, everything that I, uh, I wish the Pine Book original had, it looks like the Pine Book Pro is going to have. So, I am super excited about that, and I think that the the, the also adding the the fact that they're trying to help with the digital divide on top of that is just fantastic. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, just a quick update to when I was on my um, excited rant last week about the meeting that I went to, um, I made the mistake of indicating that Pine64 will be creating their own OS for the phone. That's not the case. Um, Dalton reached out for me from UB Ports. He actually has a development pack, and there are a number of um, phone software companies out there who have access to the development pack, so they'll just be making it available uh, I believe on a number of platforms, so they right. won't be creating their That's own. That's actually cool. That's I cool. prefer. That. I wonder if it would run selfish. Uh, it's possible. I'm not sure if if Yola has got was part of the developer thing, but they might. I mean, if they ask them, they probably would, would be willing to. Them. Yeah, that sounds good. And it's actually kind of interesting because, um, like, I would prefer them to do the hardware thing because they're a hardware company focusing mm -hmm. on the hardware side of it, and I think that's fantastic. And they also in that announcement. Uh, that was happened like last after last episode. There was an announcement when they talked about the campaign that they were doing inside of that 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 campaign for the digital divide. I think they also mentioned that they're going to be giving back to the people who uh, are creating the op open source uh, operating systems. They're going to be running on the Pine Phone, so uh, and they're going to be doing multiple batches. So like it, they haven't really decided like an individual OS. They're not trying to focus on an OS. They're going to do multiple OSs, and in different batches, will have different OSs associated. And the money that they get from those batches are going to be given in this, a percentage to the Pine Book thing, and they're going to be a percentage to be going to directly to those people who are making those OSs that make it possible for the Pine Phone to Imagine work. Imagine that providing a way to yeah. actually pay the people developing the software. Incredible. Yeah. Never thought of that would happen. Yeah, I mean, I, it's. it's <laughs> It's, it's like everything, everything else, like I was excited about the Pine book in general. Now I just like, I have like so many more reasons to be excited about what they're doing. 
So, um, so gamepad support comes to Linux in Steam Proton. This is fantastic, very, very much because like having support for Proton is is awesome. But if you can't use a specific controller for a, a certain type of game, this is not that helpful. But now we have it. So Steam Proton is the gift that keeps giving. Valve, along with Code Weavers, has been well working on a new release of 4.11-3, which adds a lot of support for gamepads. So Proton will no longer emulate all all controllers as being Xbox, but rather access the controllers directly. Yeah. This is awesome because it means that PS4 gamepads will act just like they do in Windows. So in addition to this, we get the latest D9 VK, which will need to be manually initialized at the least for now, but in the future it'll be much easier to use. Uh, the F-Sync is being used to provide more optimal support for thread pool synchronization in the Linux kernel. And just overall, this is fantastic news because like, if you're not aware, Code Weavers are the people who develop Proton and Valve is the people who are like in partnership with Code Weavers to do it. Uh, but it's like the, the work that they've been doing is so awesome that it, it basically changes the, the experience of gaming in Linux anyway. Because I've, there's actually been people who have done testing where they've got people who are not Linux users and just give them Proton or give them something, they give them Steam and then just start installing something that was in Proton and it was a seamless experience. Like that didn't exist just last year. So yep. that's awesome. Photoflare is a cross-platform image editor recommended by a member of our community, Dark One. So perhaps you just want something to edit an image and move on with your life. This may be the product for you because it features very basic image editing capabilities, paintbrushes, image filters, color adjustments, and it even has a little of touch of advanced features in there, such as batch image processing. So if that's all you're wanting to do, this one comes recommended from Dark One Photo Flare, F-L-A-R-E. Go check it out. Our tip and trick this week is privacy and encryption. Now, if you want to keep your data safe on the cloud, you want to keep it private, there is really no other way to do that than focusing on encryption. Now, privacy is very important, and the best way to protect your privacy is, again, with encryption. So there are a number of different ways to go about that. We talked at the beginning of the episode. I'm a big fan of Lux. I use it all the time. Right. My system, my laptop is encrypted with Lux. Now I can say my phone is encrypted with Lux. How cool is that? Um, but there is another way to do it because Lux does provide some problems. If you want to encrypt a certain file on a flash drive, or maybe you want to just encrypt a certain collection of files on your laptop. You don't want the entire laptop to be encrypted. I've run into situations where the laptop is owned by the employer, and so they're not able to install Lux or encrypt the entire laptop. What do you do? Well, there are various different container encryption technologies that you can use. Two of the most popular are EncFS and CryFS. And what these two, there, so it's kind of a catch-22. It's not a perfect solution yet. We're still working on it. NCFS, there have been some serious problems found with the encryption protocols, and so it's no longer considered a secure encryption. It's good enough to keep a password so it'll keep your friends out of your files if that's what you're worried about, but you certainly want to, wouldn't want to rely on an attacker that has an unlimited amount of time. CryFS has no known vulnerabilities yet, but it also hasn't been audited, and so because it hasn't been audited... You can't really say it's more secure than NCFS. You can just say that we don't know that it's as insecure as NCFS is yet. Um, the thing that I like about both NCFS and CryFS is that they perfectly enter. You can use them on any distro that you want. You can create an encrypted file container. You can then store files in there and then unmount that file container uh, all through a UI utility, which is fantastic. If you're using KDE, it gets even better because both NCFS and CryFS are built into the vaults system uh, located on your taskbar. So if you notice, you have a little padlock. If you're using KDE, click on it and you can create a new vault. Choose CryFS because that's what you'd want to choose at the moment. That is what we know. That's what we think is more secure. Uh, you choose CryFS, create a password, and all you have to do when you want to access your files, click on the little vault and click on it. And uh, it works great. I also have, I'll have to have a link in the show notes because I don't have, I have it up, but there's another utility that I use anytime I'm not on KDE to mount uh, CryFS or NCFS. And it works again, inside of a UI. So you don't have to worry about any sort of command line stuff. Um, you can read more about CryFS at CryFS.org. They have an excellent rundown on why they're uh, container technology is better for encrypting. If you want to read about NCFS, you will have a link in the show notes um, and you can check it out. But I highly recommend that you start, if you start playing with, the, that you start playing with encryption and I highly recommend that you start doing it in a container fashion because if you mess it up, it doesn't hose your whole laptop. It just messes up that one collection of files. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. 
We love our patrons and Kofi supporters. I just want to give a special shout out for all of your support. We do a live show for our patrons. So come join us if you want to be a part of the show. You can join for as little as $1 on Patreon, and that's darn near free. Or you can take advantage of some additional perks that we've put out there this week with our new tiers that we have. So go check those out. Yeah, we're also going to add some more more stuff, more perks to the tiers too. So if you sign up for now, you're still going to get some more when we get we add the rest of them. That's right. We're also on co we're also on Kofay as a way that you can support the show. Kofay offers a nice monthly option that will allow you to have the same perks as Patreon, but due to the admin fees, start at three dollars. There'll be a link in the show notes and on our website to join Kofi. So now you made me screw it up. The, the perks include <laughs> things like access to the live shows as well as an unedited, unedited version of the show, as well as our sincere gratitude, which is probably the biggest thing that you can purchase for, you know, just a couple bucks a month. So make sure to check <laughs> us out on coffee. Buy us a cup of coffee. We would sure appreciate your support. So please get back to us and let us know what you think or ask any burning questions via numerous methods. We have email at comments at destination linux.org our Telegram group, Discord, Twitter, Mastodon, and other ways that you can find us where Michael has put the information on destinationlinux.org forward slash contact. So please keep your comments and questions coming. We love to read them and hear of ways that we might be able to improve the show. And remember, we are asking specifically for video content to use on the show. And if you want some more content, the fun doesn't stop here. We have our own channels that you can check out. You can check out Ryan. You can find, you can find him on uh, youtube.com slash dosgeek, where he fills your brains on hardware, software, and all things Linux. You can check out Zeb's content on youtube.com slash Boss, where you can find him playing games and doing occasional Gentoo installations and how-tos. Uh, you can find my content at tuxdigital.com, where I have an in-depth weekly Linux GNU's podcast called This Week in Linux and other Linux-related content. You can check out Noah's content where he talks in like next this coming week where he's going to talk about Selfish OS on his radio, weekly talk radio show at 6 p.m. Central on Tuesdays. You can join him and go to asknoahshow.com to find out more. And you can uh, make, make sure to like that smash button and share the show on social media. Everybody have a great week, and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.